Astronomy is about discovery in that, uh, in fact, what we do is we don't predict things, we just, you know, look in the sky until we find them. And that's not always true. I think black holes were found on blackboards largely by Robert Oppenheimer in the late 1930s before he got diverted to some other project that escapes my mind at the moment. Uh, I think the same could be said for extraterrestrial intelligence. I think that they've been predicted at the local cineplex. Now, why do we think that they're out there? Let me just back up a little bit, and since many of you are, in fact, writing about science or reporting on science, point out to you something that struck me as some sort of very low-grade epiphany a little while ago. Because there are all these stories in, in the media about, you know, some new lander on Mars, or, you know, we found another planet, and this sort of thing. And in fact, this was part of a, a larger story that was playing out. There's a three-pronged approach to finding life in space. I can give you the bottom line right here something that the CEO of BP probably wouldn't do for you. <laughs> Let me give you the bottom line at the beginning, and that is that we have no compelling evidence of any life in space. None, right? And that includes PONSCO. Uh, 1996, the biggest science news story, of course, was ALH 84001, uh, and my neighbors were aghast. They said, all the, that, that tax money going to find dead pond scum on Mars, and I've got live pond scum in my bathtub, what's the deal? <laughs> they, they missed the point, of course. But that turned out not to be terribly compelling, so we don't know about any life. But there, are, there is this three-way horse race, and let me just name the nags. Uh, one, we might find life nearby, okay, under the sands of Mars, maybe the moons of Jupiter, a couple of moons of Saturn look promising. There are currently seven other worlds in our solar system beside the Earth that might have liquid oceans, mostly water, but in the case of Titan, probably liquid natural gas. Okay, so when you have liquids and you have a lot of carbon chemistry and you have temperatures that, well, never mind what the temperatures are, but that's always, uh, there's at least the implicit suggestion that maybe you fomented some life in those environments. So that's one horse. And if you say, how long is it going to take us to before we can land, you know, little boats on the lakes of Titan or drill, you know, a couple of hundred feet down into the surface of Mars by sending Bruce Willis there, uh, and all those people are going to get fired from BP, and send them all there. Time scale for that is on the order of 20 years. So that's one horse. Within 20 years, maybe we'll find at least some biology elsewhere. Okay. Uh, the second possibility is that we detect it, we sniff it out by building the kinds of telescopes that are now on hold, that have been developed by NASA and others, that could sniff the atmospheres of extrasolar planets and maybe find oxygen or methane. As you know, there's a lot of methane in this, in this room due to what is politely called bovine flatulence or porcine flatulence. And uh, so this would be a technique for finding pigs in space. And again, the time scale for building these things, it's all on hold now, only because of lack of money. It, 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 there's a light motif to this talk, and that is lack of money. But, uh, but 20 years might be a reasonable time to build those instruments and possibly find an extrasolar planet where it has the right uh, out of equilibrium composition of, say, oxygen in its atmosphere that would tell you that at least chlorophyll is not restricted to Earth or something like chlorophyll. So that's horse number two, and again, 20 years. And the third horse is SETI, and that is to short circuit all this other stuff and just find intelligent life because that sort of you know, fills in all the intermediate steps. Can you get life started and so forth and so on? Um, I might say, speaking of money, just very briefly, SETI is completely privately funded. We're just dependent on people sending us checks. The other uh, approaches are being pursued by NASA, by the European Space Agency, and so forth. There's quite a bit of money for that, although not enough to do it, in my mind, as quickly as we would really like to do it. But nonetheless, the, the big space agencies are betting on finding microscopic life because, and I don't dare call that simple life, the biologists really object if you call it simple life. They say it's not simple, but maybe I can call it stupid life. Uh, so, and the assumption here is that stupid life is far more prevalent than the intelligent variety. And anybody who talks to their neighbors knows that's true. So, <laughs> so we're, you know, we're, we're part of the project. And I'm also implicitly making the projection that we may find intelligent life within 20 years. Okay. I've got everybody that I talked to, a cup of Starbucks that will do it within 24 years. And if not, you know, okay, at least you get a cup of coffee. All right. Um, so why we think they're out there, well, there are a lot of obvious things in the last, uh, what has it been since 1995, you know, 15 years, we found planets around other stars, uh, more than 450 of them. That actually, that's, that's a nice number, but that isn't what's interesting. The interesting number is, but what fraction of stars have planets? 
right? And I've talked to people, like I asked Jeff Harsey this question again a couple of months ago. I said, Jeff, if you had perfect telescopes, what fraction of stars do you think would show planets? And he said, oh, well, maybe a half, maybe three quarters. Well, to an astronomer, a half is the same as all, right? So all stars have planets, you know, within factors of two. And of course, planets are like kittens. You get a couple, you don't you just get one, you know, you get eight, sometimes nine. And so that means that the number of planets in the Milky Way galaxy is on the order of a trillion. Most of them are going to be worthless, like, you know, Mercury and Neptune. Neptune's probably not very big in your life. But, you know, it's hard to believe that out of a trillion, this is the only one that's really good enough to have not only spawned life, but something clever. So that's a, that's a numbers game. The other thing that's interesting is that there's a whole category of research, astrobiology. One of the things that are studied under astrobiology is how life got started on Earth. Okay. And, uh, and, and in particular, how long ago did life get started on Earth? Right. And there is un pretty much incontrovertible evidence that life got started on Earth at least by three and a half billion years ago. Remember, the Earth's only four and a half billion years old. And there's some less reliable evidence going back as far as four billion years. The point is, life got started on Earth very quickly. You know, the Earth was here and very quickly was carpeted with biology. And that suggests, it doesn't prove, it's only an example of one, but it does suggest that this is not a terribly improbable thing, right? It, 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 life got started so quickly, maybe it's easy to get started. So there's that. Uh, the trillion planets I've already mentioned. The third reason why we think they, they might be out there is just Copernicus. Because if not, if you think that this, that you are the smartest things in the galaxy, my, my office mates think that, but not me, but themselves. If you think that, then you believe in miracles. Because that would be the miracle. The miracle is not finding intelligence elsewhere. That just means we're just another duck in the row. And if, you know, astronomy has taught us anything in the last 500 years, it's that every time we thought we were special, we were wrong. But maybe we're biologically special, even though we're not astronomically or physically or chemically special. But, you know, I'm, I'm not betting on that. So how can we find them? Well, there are all sorts of approaches. One is just to look for artifacts. And that's legit. I mean, that's what they did in 2001, right? They just found this monolith on the moon. I mean, who knows? Maybe the aliens, you know, found Earth that had oxygen in the atmosphere as long ago as two billion years ago. So we've been broadcasting this signal for two billion years that there's life on Earth, and it's green, and it, you know, whatever, right? And, and there's maybe some aliens who were in the neighborhood, visited the bivalves or the trilobites or who knows what. And they thought, well, you know, this planet might conceivably at some point develop something that, uh, you know, can... I don't know, compose rock and roll, something interesting. <laughs> and rather than leaving some sort of time capsule here on Earth, it'll get chewed up by plate tectonics and weather, they left it on the moon. This was sort of the premise there in 2001. We haven't dug up the moon, so we don't know. I mean, you know, but that's a legitimate approach. All we've dug up, I think, is West Virginia. So we don't know about the, <laughs> the, the moon yet. Uh, and, you know, we don't even know about the Lagrange points in, you know, the Earth-Moon system. Maybe they left a time capsule there. I mean, it's worth looking. There have been some searches, but they haven't been terribly deep. So uh, you could look for artifacts. So you could look for astro-engineering, right? The universe is three times as old as the Earth, so most of the societies out there, if there are a lot of them, are considerably older than ours, or at least got started a long, a long time ago. And maybe they've graduated to the point of building very large structures that we could see. Uh, one thing that has been looked for, Dyson, not spheres, but Dyson swarms, you know, just swarms of solar collecting uh, satellites that orbit somebody else's star, and the backside, of course, radiates a lot of infrared that we might be able to detect. We might see an infrared excess in stellar spectra. A few hundred stars have, looked at, have been looked at, but only a few hundred. That's worth doing, too. So you have artifacts. Uh, the second possibility is, you know, <laughs> look for visits. Uh, miles. <laughs> the fact, I, I think you're aware that the belief that the aliens are not only out there, but that they're here, you know, buzzing the skies in their uh, saucers and occasionally abducting you for experiments that are not appropriate on a first date. That's not a, uh, that's not a fringe belief. That's the uh, poll since the 1960s have shown that on the order of between a third and a half of all Americans believe that that's true. In a poll taken by CNN and Time, and I think it was 2002, showed that 80% of Americans agree with the statement that the government knows about UFOs, or aliens, I should say, knows about alien visitors and is keeping the news from you. The government has been doing this at least since 1947. And I always point out to you, this is the same government that runs the Postal Service, but <laughs> probably I shouldn't say this in D.C. Okay, 
<laughs> so I won't say anything more about the UFOs. I get calls every day from people who are having difficulty with aliens in their personal lives. And I, <laughs> and I, I take them all seriously because I don't think, I, I don't recall a single phone call where I thought that this was a hoax. And these people are serious. They've seen something. They've experienced something. And uh, so I try and give them some suggestions, but obviously that's not what we're doing. The third approach, of course, is SETI, and that is to find the aliens in situ, find them at home by eavesdropping on signals. I'll talk about the radio very briefly here, but we also do uh, optical SETI. In other words, look for flashing laser lights. In fact, that might be a very, I think that that's actually a very good field to get into, uh, optical SETI, because so little has been done. And if, from the alien's point of view, this is something that may be worth pointing out, I think it's safe to say that no aliens know of your existence. You know, they, they don't know the Homo sapiens exists, which makes it doubly perplexing that they've come all this way for these, you know, salacious experiments that wouldn't work anyhow, uh, because they don't know about you, right? The evidence for our existence is what 60 or 70 light years out. You know, since the Second World War, when we constructed very large transmitters, large in terms of power, high frequency, the kinds of signals that would make it into space and could be, in fact, detected. Uh, so that, that signal is only, as I say, 70 light years out. I mean, your first episode of I Love Lucy, I think, was 1953. So what is that? 57 light years out. And within that distance, they're you know, on the order of five to 10,000 star systems, which is a small number. Okay. So I think it's safe to say the aliens do not know that we're here. So I doubt that they would be sending this interminable signal, you know, bombarding the Earth, or at least our solar system, for thousands of years at a time just to talk to the trilobites, right? Because the trilobites' accomplishments in technology were minuscule. Uh, and yet, that has been the premise of SETI for a long time, to look for a signal, some sort of narrow band, CW signal that's always on. I think what might make much more sense for the aliens is to say, look, we're going to have a low power on the directional transmitter, maybe we put it in the center of the galaxy or wherever we are. And that's, you know, forever broadcasting whatever it is they want to broadcast, right? And we'll find all these planets that are, you know, some sort of biogenic signature in their atmosphere. So we know there's some life there, but we don't know if there's any intelligent life. And we'll just ping each one of them once every 10 minutes or every 10 days or every 10 years with a big bright flash from a laser just to tell them, look in this part of the sky because there's this low power transmitter. If you spend enough time, you'll find it, right? So that strikes me as a, as a reasonable strategy for them because they might have hundreds of thousands, being optimistic, of such uh, planets known to have life on their list, and we're just on the list, and we should just look for an occasional flash. If you saw such a flash, right, if astronomers or anybody else, I mean, you know, your next door neighbor were to look in some part of the sky and see a flash, and then we were to see that again, you know, two weeks later, you would study the heck out of that. You would, every telescope in the world would spend a lot of time looking at that spot on the sky. Okay. So I think that there's something to be said for that. All right. Uh, what about the search? How do we do SETI these days? SETI has been done for 50 years now, in April, uh, this year, that marked the 50th anniversary of the first SETI experiment that was done by Frank Drake. Miles has mentioned Frank Drake. Uh, Frank Drake in uh, lovely Green Bank, West Virginia, three hours from here, using an 85-foot antenna. He pointed it at two nearby stars, that only a dozen light years away, sunlight stars. Uh, that was the first SETI experiment. He didn't hear anything. Actually, he did hear something, but it turned out to be the U.S. military, which didn't count as extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, but that experiment has been done more or less the same way ever since, but with better equipment. And using other people's telescopes all the time, almost all the time. So that's really slowed down the search. Uh, Paul Davies has a book out now called The Eerie Silence, because after 50 years, you have guys haven't found anything. That must be significant. It's not significant. It's not significant. The number of stars that have been looked at carefully, that is to say with high sensitivity and over a wide range of frequencies, is like 750, right? That's it, 750. Fewer than 1,000 have been looked at carefully in a galaxy of a couple hundred billion stars. Right? So that's, that's, a, that, that's like going to Africa looking for a megafauna, right? And you land on the, on the west coast of Africa and you look at one city block of territory and you say, well, you know, I didn't see any big things with long you know, noses that can pick up peanuts. I didn't see anything big. So I guess there's no, there are no megafauna critters here on this continent after looking at one city block. So that's what we've done in SETI. So it is not surprising. In fact, it would be surprising if we had found something up till now. By borrowing other people's <coughs> antennas, of course, what you're doing is you're trying to do oncology. You're trying to do cancer research, but always having to borrow the microscope. So of course, it's slow. It's been slow. 
that's a money thing. But we are building a, a uh, new antenna together with the radio astronomy lab at the University of California at Berkeley, up in the Cascades of California, called the Allen Telescope Array, because Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, most of you know that, uh, gave enough money to get the R&D done for that thing. So we have the first 42 antennas. They're small antennas, like 20 feet across. It's a big array. It's a great thing if you get all of it completed, which would be 350 antennas, then uh, not only would it be fantastic for SETI, but it would also be very useful for radio astronomy because with all those antennas, you get all the baselines at once. This is speaking to those of you who know what this is all about. Uh, and you can make you know, pictures in a few minutes of the sky that are very high quality. So that's up in the Cascades. We hope that uh, we can get the funding to finish that one. Now the point about all this uh, is, uh, you know, if we've only looked at 750 stars in 50 years, uh, you might be inclined to think, well, this is kind of hopeless. This is going to take forever. And in fact, even my mom, who lives over at Bailey's Crossroads, occasionally will call me up and say, so Seth, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> I tell my mom, that, come on, mom. I mean, you know I don't want a real job. But in any case, uh, how long is it going to take before we find ET? Well. That depends on how many societies are out there broadcasting signals that are going right through your bodies as you look through or listen to this enervating presentation. Uh, we don't know what the answer to that is. There are estimates, which is a euphemism for guesses. Uh, Carl Sagan thought there might be a million. Right? Uh, Isaac Asimov figured 670,000. I guess he was smarter than these other guys, but he did do this to two decimal places. Uh, and, and Frank Drake himself figures 10,000. Well, if you take the most conservative of those estimates, then you, you need to look at a, a, maybe a couple of million stars before you have a chance of pulling out the winning lottery ticket. We've, we've li looked at fewer than 1,000. But here's the, the big conjunction, and that is the, the speed of SETI is increasing. In fact, it has been increasing ever since 1960. And if you, if you plot up some metric of the speed, you find out that it follows Moore's law perfectly. It doubles every 18 months. Now, that's not coincidence, of course. That's because uh, a lot of this is simply dependent on digital electronics and, and you know, data processing. So it's not surprising that it, it does this. But that means that whatever you do in the next two years is equivalent to everything you've done in all the years previously, on average. Right? So you know that means that something like the Allen Telescope Array could, in the next two dozen years, look at millions of star systems. Millions instead of 750. And that's why I bet you that cup of Starbucks that we may find it. Okay, before I turn over to questions, let me just say one, one other thing, and that is what happens if you find a signal. Uh, people, the, the public has a great interest in this, as you know, and this is one of the things they're most interested in. They want to know, how will this affect me, the car buyer, if you find a signal? To begin with, will you even tell me? Or will the government just shut it all down and cover it all up, right? Now, you know, I, I can tell them, don't blow the face, that don't worry, there's no policy of secrecy at SETI, and there isn't, by the way. Uh, so you will know, but you, they, you know, they, they say you're part of the conspiracy, right? <laughs> in which case, I want to raise <laughs> if I'm getting, But that's, in fact, not true. We know it's not true because there have been false alarms. It was the, the most famous one. I wrote this up, actually. It was in 1997, in, the, in June of 1997, we picked up a signal that for about 16 hours looked like the real deal. We were using an antenna, actually in Green Bank, the 140-foot uh, Green Bank telescope. And for 16 hours, we thought, this might be it. And it was very interesting to see what happened, because this was a real test, right? Uh, at 3.30 in the morning, we were in, in Mountain View in California. We were sitting around the computers looking, and nobody went home. Nobody went to in and out Burger. You're just sitting there watching these things. And I was getting very nervous, because I thought, this is going to ruin the whole week. You know, i got things scheduled. i got lunch, because i got this, i got that, right? I mean, this sounds crazy to you, but those are the kinds of things you're, you're thinking about. Uh, and I kept waiting for the guys, the men in black, somebody from inside the beltway to show up and shut us all down. <laughs> I always ask people, why do you think the government would shut it down? Wouldn't you want this, these data to be distributed to everybody who could study them? I mean, why, why would you shut They say, oh, well, the public couldn't handle the news. Right? There'd be civic unrest. Look, a third of the population thinks that there are greys walking around abducting their spouse, and they don't seem to be upset about that. <laughs> I, just, I, just can't I just can't believe if they were to open up the paper. All right, forget opening the paper. If they open up their browser and, and, and they were to read, you know, scientists find signal coming from 847 light years away that they would say, that's it, Marge. The, the scientists have found an alien signal. I'm not going to work today. I'm going to ride in the streets. I'm just going to see what happens. <laughs> But the most interesting thing of that 1997 experiment, by the way, it turned out to be the SOHO satellite that 
the signal from the, the telemetry from the SOHO satellite was bouncing around the steel work of the 140 foot just in the right way to mimic what we were looking for. But uh, at 9.30 in the morning, I was at my desk half asleep and because uh, we'd been up all night. This was 16 hours into it. The phone rings and it's Bill Broad of the New York Times. And he said, well, I'll say, what about that signal you're following? I'm not going to lie to the New York Times. I said, well, yeah, we're following the signal, but I mean, you know, uh, they've always turned out to be terrestrial interference. Can I call you back in three hours because we, we're sort of following the lead here. He said, okay. And within three hours, we knew that it was a SOHO satellite. So it wasn't a story. But what was interesting about that is that this was 16 hours into it, and the media were already calling. Okay. So this idea that the government will shut it all down. I mean, the, the mayor of Mountain View didn't even call. No, nobody from the government showed any interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody. All right, so what would it mean? Suppose well, we found this signal. Well, of course, the, the first thing is, you know, it, it's very comparable to ALH 84001. By the way, that, that idea that the public would go nuts, that, that experiment's already been run, right, at the beginning of the 20th century when there was this vast hydraulic civilization on Mars, remember? Nobody seemed to get terribly upset about it. And they were only, after all, 30 million li uh, miles away. Not everywhere. Uh, okay, so what does happen? It would, be, it would be a very big story, of course. In fact, I once polled a bunch of science writers like 10 years ago and said, how, how big a story would you rank that? And they, in, all of them said, this would be the biggest story of all time. One person said, second only to the Kennedy assassination. And that was the only exception. <laughs> Obviously, it'd be a very big story, and you would try and get as many data as you could by pointing whatever instruments you have in the direction of this signal. Keep in mind that, like most radio astronomers, we integrate, we're, like all astronomers, actually, we average the incoming signal over seconds or minutes. So that means you throw the message away. Like the message is presumably some very, very fast modulation. Uh, but you throw that away. So you'd have to go back and build a very much larger instrument and then, you know, that has the right time constants and so forth that you could find the message and then, you know. But that would take years. But I think that would happen. At that point, I think it would happen. And what could you learn from that? Well, that's all very, very speculative. Uh, obviously, it's a statistical argument, but a very strong one, that anything you find is coming from a society that's more advanced than you are. And, and, and not by 100 years, it's statistically much more likely. It's at least thousands of years and maybe much more than that. So that means if you can understand anything, then, well, obviously you, it, it's like giving Neanderthals English lessons and a key to the Library of Congress. You know, maybe, that's, maybe that changes your custom grab and free living lifestyle. I don't know. I think it does. Uh, I don't know whether we would understand anything they're sending our way or not. I mean, I think that's problematic. Personally, I'm not terribly optimistic we'd understand it. But I leave you only with this, and that is it would tell you something you know, philosophically, very, very interesting. Namely, that what has happened on this planet, not just the genesis of life, but the ultimate production of something that's clever enough to come and sit around here this morning, uh, is not a miracle that we are just, indeed, another kid on the block. Okay, why don't I stop there, and if there are any questions? Okay, I'm sure there are some questions for sure. Um, once again, you, you guys know the drill by now. Sorry to make you go through all this. Um, well, Seth, I, I've asked this before. How do we know what bandwidth to look in, what wavelength, all those things. I, I mean, you just take the logical, I mean, you know, what we assume to be the logical uh, frequencies? Yeah, that's a good question for which there really aren't terribly great answers. Uh, ET never sent us an email saying, you know, I'll be at 1527 megahertz on the dot. <laughs> you don't know. In, in the past, the approach was to try and outsmart the aliens by saying, look, if they're trying to get in touch, they'll put this signal somewhere near a frequency we all know about, like the 1420 megahertz line of neutral hydrogen. That's marked on their radio dials, it's marked on our radio dials. They might put the signal near there. That, that's been the strategy in the past. Today's strategy, given that you can build receivers that can cover you know, hundreds of millions of channels at a time, and a channel is about one hertz, uh, the idea is just look at as much of the spectrum as you can. So that's sort of the brute force approach. Uh, Bob Zimmerman, freelance. Uh, Sadie, I've read a few articles uh, of signals you've gotten that are yet not explained, are just mysterious. Could, can you uh, either clarify or describe some of those? And are there mystery signals you've picked up over the years that you can't explain at this point or are puzzled about? Bob, you have a need to know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there have been. I mean, in, in, but the, you'll, you'll note that the signals that were not checked out, in other words, that we don't know whether they were terrestrial or non-terrestrial, uh, tend to all be in the past. And the reason for that is, I mean, not you know, just yesterday, I mean, really in the past. And the reason is, in, the, in, in you know, 10, 20 years ago, the way you would do this experiment is you go to the observatory, you would record all the data on computer tape, right, take it back to your home institution, 
play the tapes, analyze the data, and then you would find signals. When I was sitting at Arecibo, when we were doing this experiment at Arecibo, I counted, you know, we're getting a new <coughs> signal every 10 seconds. And you get a lot of signals when you have tens of millions of channels and a big antenna. That's not surprising. So in the old days, you'd get this signal, and now you're stuck. It's sitting there on your desk, but you're not at the telescope anymore, so you can't go back and see, is it still there? Today, of course, you can. And so when you can do that, when you can immediately follow up, and that's what the, the tactic we use, then you, know, you can rule them all out. The most famous of the uh, signals reported in the past, and the one that the public finds uh, interesting, is the so-called wow signal. I think you, many of you have heard that. It was 1977. It was at Ohio State. Jerry Amon, one of the astronomers, came in in the morning looking through the computer printout, as it was in those days. And he sees a big signal, and he writes wow next to it. So this becomes the triumph of marketing over a product, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> because it's famous. And it was never explained, but on the other hand, that, that antenna had a second horn on it, a second receiver, if you will. And it reobserved that same spat, uh, spot on the sky 70 seconds later, a minute later. And it didn't see the signal. And it has been looked at subsequently uh, several times by people with larger antennas, the VLA, I think they did one, in fact. But with larger antennas over mm -hmm. larger bandwidth, and it has never been seen again. So all you can say is, well, sure, maybe it was ET, and then he went on vacation. Right after, you know, I mean, you can't categorically say that's not possible, but it's not science. It's not a discovery if you see it once and you can't confirm it. The exceptions to that are these you know, planets found with gravitational lensing, but that's a different deal. Here you cannot unequivocally say that was ET unless you can see it over and over. What were called signals? If you ask people at Ohio State, uh, they will tell you most likely it was terrestrial interference. Seth, you rely on the... Um the kindness of uh, at least one billionaire and, and several other uh, strangers who care about you. Uh, you know, NASA famously cut the cord with you back in what mid eight mid nineties. Ninety three. Ninety three. Um, do you prefer being independent in, in many respects, or would you rather be back on the government uh, dole? Dole. <laughs> um, well, obviously, you know, if if you're dependent on government funding, that has its own, you know. Concerns, but I have to say that it's very, very difficult. The, the, the amount of money required to do this is a few million dollars a year. That's you know, order magnitude. And believe it or not, that's you know that would be a small amount of money for the Pentagon, for example, or most government agencies. For the SETI Institute, that's an enormous amount of money. It's very difficult to get that when you have people sending you checks fifty dollars at a time. Uh, it was it was canceled from NASA in '93, not because NASA didn't like the program. It was less than one tenth of one percent of the NASA budget. Right? It, was, it was costing taxpayers, I think it was four cents per year per taxpayer. In fact, when the, when the Congressional, it was done by Congress, of course, the Senate, when the Senate voted to suspend NASA funding of SETI, I drove home and my next door neighbor said, well, Seth, looks like you're out of a job, but at least I'm saving four cents this year. <laughs> when, I, when I bought a BMW. <laughs> uh, I, I honestly think that this is something that the government ought to support. That's my personal opinion. So you, you would take the constraints that, that is incumbent with that? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Those constraints are, you know, uh, constraints are better than not doing the experiment. Okay. Question. Yeah, I'm Harvey Leifert, freelance writer. Uh, we have made at least two efforts to communicate with uh, people beyond, or things beyond, uh, the spacecraft that carry, I think, Richard Nixon's voice and some pictures of humans and greetings. No wonder they're not language. talking. <laughs> uh, is there any thought of uh, doing anything along those lines again in a different way? That is actually trying to reach people on the other side, or is the alternative view that maybe it's better they don't know we're here uh, more prevalent? You raise a very timely question because Stephen Hawking was quoted a lot in the media a couple of weeks ago. I'm sure many of you know that as saying, you know, contact with the aliens might be dangerous because, after all, look at what happened to the North American natives when the Europeans arrived and all that stuff. M mind you, Hawking was saying this at least 10 years ago, I think 20, so there's nothing new, but it was in connection with this Discovery Channel show. Two things about that. Uh, people broadcast all the time uh, in, in direct, uh, deliberate transmissions to the sky. Uh, the uh, guy by the name of Alexander Zaitsev in Russia has been doing this in many projects. Uh, the, the Canadians did it. NASA did it in 19, well, no, NASA did what, two years ago, right? They broadcast one of the Beatles songs across the universe, right? They, they sent it to Polaris. It would take a while to get there, and if the Polaris respond, you know, we could, another, what, 100 some years, whatever it'll take, you know, please repeat that. Uh, so there have been some of these things, but they're not serious because they're very short. 
if you're going to do it seriously, you have to spend some time on it and you want to think about it. I, this is called active SETI. It's something that I actually think is not a bad idea because it would give you a lot of insight into how to listen if you were confronted with the problems of being a transmit. So I think, from forgetting all other points of view, I think that that's, that's interesting. As far as it's dangerous, this is a highly emotional issue. I get, I get hate mail about this, right? Because there are people who think, you know, on the one hand, this might be a good thing to do, and there are other people who say, this is like shouting in the jungle, right? Maybe the chances that the aliens are, are malevolent and will launch their missiles because they picked up, you know, a signal from us are small, but on the other hand, are you willing to risk the entire planet, right? Now, this gets you into the questions of, well, would the aliens be benevolent or malevolent? And a lot of people have a lot of opinions about that, but that's all alien sociology. And I have to say that the data set for alien sociology is sparse. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's, you, can, you can argue that to the bovines return home, but that's, that doesn't help because you don't know, right? You don't However, watch V on TV, obviously. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but there is this, and, and this is my point of view. If you're going to worry about this, you're worrying about the wrong things because it's too late. It's too late. We've been broadcasting 60 or 70 years into space. Those signals are out there. There's no getting them back. And the people who are against any deliberate broadcast say, yes, but those are very weak compared to a deliberate broadcast in the space, which is true. But they are not, they are only a few orders of magnitude weaker, two, maybe three. And that difference is something that any technological society makes up within a century or two. Particularly if they can get, uh, any society that has the technological capability to threaten the Earth across hundreds of light years can certainly pick up those signals. And in fact, one of the problems with jet lag is I was up at 2 o'clock this morning, and one of the things that just worked out, if they can get just 500 astronomical units away from their own star and use their star as a gravitational lens, we've heard a lot about gravitational lensing here this morning, they would be able to see from uh, 500 or 1,000 light years, they would be able to see our street lamps. Right. So the idea that we should shut down the BBC, NBC, and by the way, all the radar at Reagan Airport, if you want that, in, by the way, turn off all the street lights. Uh, I don't think that's a terribly good idea, but that's what it would apply, because otherwise you're fooling yourself thinking that they can't find our leakage. And by the way, you don't just do it for this week, this year, or this decade. You'd have to do that forever. To me, that sounds bizarre in the extreme. <laughs> so, so let's say you do make contact, and it's, you know, 800 light years or so. It's kind of difficult to tell a joke. Back and forth. I mean, the, the, pun, the punchline. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, what what this requires is sustained commitment that um, is, is hard for those of us, especially in this town where things are on two and four year cycles, uh, to to conjure up. Well, I mean, sort of play it out for you. Play it, how, how would you see this truly becoming some sort of dialogue? Yeah. Well, Miles, that's there, there's your there's your mistake. This is not about dialogue. It's not about dialogue. If they're, if they're 800 light years away, you're right, you say, hi, you want to join our book club, and 1,600 years later, <laughs> it's a polite refusal. I mean, that's, I agree with you, that's completely nutty, that's tedious. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, they know that. They know that. They know that you're not next door, that this is not about conversation. Uh, this, this is like, a, it, it's one way. It's one way communication. And that's why I think, you know, a lot of people think about how are we going to communicate? Should we use mathematics? Should we send them the value of pi? I learned the value of pi in seventh grade. You finally hear from the aliens, you learn the value of pi. That is a, <laughs> <laughs> the Fibonacci series of your day brand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's all complete I, I, you know, I, I apologize. I even wrote it in a paper. If we were going to send something, I'd just send the Google servers. Send it all. And I think they would do the same thing. They would send it all. This is like communication with the Roman Empire. It's one way. It's one way. You can talk back to Julius Caesar, but people look funny at you. It's all one way. You learn a lot. You can learn a lot, even though they were less advanced than we are, right? But you would still learn a lot. It's one way. Right? And because it's one way, they're not going to just send you a greeting card with Richard Nixon, the equivalent of Richard Nixon's <laughs> voice, and, you know, drawing of a nude couple or all that sort of stuff. They're not going to just send you a greeting card. They're going to send it all. They're going to send you lots and lots and lots of information because you're not talking back to them. That's my take. And why would we send out all that information? Well, I mean, you know, we, I, I'm not sure that there's any great pressure for us to, to talk to the aliens, frankly. I mean, we've had radio for 100 years. They may have had it for 100,000. You know, I, I sort of put the burden on them. But that's, you know, I'm sure that if we were to pick up a signal, anybody with the ability to put a transmitter on their backyard satellite dish will do so and start broadcasting their personal philosophies. 
I'm just sure of that. Uh, so maybe that's why we would do it. But again, I don't think that this is conversation. I don't think you should look at it as conversation. <clears throat> All right, so you, you kind of alluded to it. You, you think people will just kind of go about their, their daily lives. But does, doesn't, if there were a discovery like this, dialogue or no, obviously no, in your view, what, um, how would this change life on this planet? Would it at all? Well, in the beginning, I don't think it would change life on this planet. I think that that's overstated. It would just be an extraordinarily interesting story. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, Copernicus says, well, you know, the Earth is at the center of the solar system. Actually, the sun is. It just moves the center of the universe 93 million miles. A lot of people get upset, but if you're a fishmonger, you know, continue to mong, mong your fish, right? It isn't that, oh, well, that's it. I mean, I'm not doing my job anymore. And it, it, that is, that I think it would be completely analogous to that. I mean, oh, you mean they're canal digging creatures on Mars? Well, okay, but uh, you know, I got this report to get out. I mean, I, I don't think that that affects you. What affects you is if you get information that you can decode. I think that does affect you because, uh, I mean, because they'd be so far advanced. I mean, I, I think if, if you could go back to maybe the 13th century, when these alchemists, you know, what's your day job? Well, I'm trying to turn lead into gold. Right? And say, well, look, you may want to read this textbook from the 21st century, this chemistry textbook. Yeah. And you'd completely destroy that guy's livelihood, right? So, I mean, that could be, there could be some effect from knowledge, from knowledge. But I think as far as just learning that they're out there, I think that's an extraordinarily interesting question to answer because it sort of calibrates us. But I don't think that it results in you know, civil unrest or any of these dire projections that you, you see so often. Yeah.